Hey guys, what is up? My name is Nicholas Yeo and welcome to my channel. If you haven't already met me, I'm a Singaporean who completed my medical degree in the UK and I'm currently an anaesthetic trainee in the Glasgow Royal Infirmary in Scotland. So some of my family members has reached out to me recently about a young lady's passing in Singapore after she's received a uh, general anesthesia for a simple wisdom tooth extraction surgery. And in this video today, I hope to be able to provide you guys some education about the condition and the medical terms that was stated in the articles so that you guys will have a clearer picture of what's been going on. Now before we start, I would like to express my deepest condolences and sympathies to the family involved of the deceased member because I can't imagine how devastating of a news it might be to hear about a young, fit and healthy lady's passing from a simple wisdom tooth extraction surgery. And in addition to that, I hope the mental health and well-being of the uh, doctor looking after her is well looked after just because I can't imagine how stressful it is to actually have someone young and healthy passed away under her care and also the uh, multiple investigations that she must have gone through in what I assume with also multiple court proceedings. Now to start off, let's have a quick look together for the benefit of those who might not also know about the news to have a quick read about the article and to try and figure out what's going on. Now the article published by the Straits Times talks about an incident which happened on the 8th of May 2019, which was three years ago. And this involves a, a young 24-year-old girl who underwent an elective um, operation to get four of her wisdom tooth removed under um, general anesthesia, but unfortunately passed away on the same day. Now, wisdom tooth extraction is a relatively simple procedure. I also had all four of mine removed before I went to military. You know, I got in in the morning and managed to get home in the early afternoon. So it must be a devastating news to the family to hear about this young lady uh, who passed away on the same day from a simple dental procedure. So on the 30th of September, the coroner ruled this um, incident death by misadventure. Now, if you look up on what death by misadventure or medical misadventure, it states here that it's a, a verdict indicating that the death was due to an accident and not to a crime or somebody's negligence. So there isn't any uh, negligence of the doctors involved in this case. Now, before she went for surgery, she had a pre-operative assessment done and it's only been shown that she has high cholesterol, a slightly high BMI and a skin condition. She had two general anesthetics in the past with uh, no side effects and she had no family history of a malignant hypothermia. So. To an uh, anesthetic doctor like me, she doesn't look like she was uh, in any high risk of getting this condition. So during the day of her surgery, she went into the operating theater about 8.20 in the morning. The operating time was about 90 minutes and the operation finished at 10.20. So she was intubated through the nose into her windpipe so that the dentist can actually work on her teeth. Now. Towards the end of the procedure, the anesthetic doctors realized that her carbon dioxide levels were slightly elevated. Now, there are a multitude of reasons why carbon dioxide levels would be, would be raised in an operation. It could be patient factors, operative factors, and machine factors, but I will not get too deep into it. Now, when the operation was about to finish, the anesthetic doctors also realized that the carbon dioxide levels has since worsened and she started to desaturate in terms of oxygen levels which uh, the anesthetic doctors gave her more oxygen to supplement that. When the operation finished, the um, anesthetic doctors took off the, uh, the anesthetic gas which kept her asleep but she did not wake up. On top of that, she was found to have a temperature of 42 degrees which is insanely high if you can imagine a fever of 38 degrees can already make you feel very uncomfortable so the anesthetic doctors gave her some paracetamol into her veins to try and keep her temperature down and also gave her some ice packs to cool her body temperature she was then transported to the singapore general hospital where she died at 1 30 which is a 
three hours later. So there's this huge gap of three hours that we have no um, information about. So I guess the big the big important questions here which the uh, general public would like to understand is firstly, what is malignant hypothermia? What are the signs, symptoms? Is it a rare disease? What does it mean by its uh, uh, genetic disorder? And also, was appropriate treatment given? So in this video, I'll try my best to um, answer these questions and give you a feeling of what I thought went on. If we start off by looking at one of the fact sheets uh, produced by the Royal College of Anesthetists in the UK, malignant hypothermia is considered a rare condition which leads to progressively high temperatures in the body and it's normally caused by some of the anesthetic drugs or gases that we give to our patients. So studies have shown that the risk of malignant hypothermia when given a general anesthetic would range from 1 in 30,000 to 1 in 200,000. Now, in the Straits Times article, they say that the risk was 1 in 50,000. So if you put it in layman's terms, let's say if I were to deliver 1,000 general anesthesias a year, it would take me 50 years. So that's when I'm almost 80 years old to actually experience a confirmed case of malignant hypothermia. And that's how really rare this condition is. But malignant hypothermia can be fatal if not treated quickly. Have I ever experienced a case of malignant hypothermia? No, but anesthetic trainees like me are trained and taught about how to recognize malignant hypothermia and how to treat them so that if it ever happens, we would know what to do. Now, malignant hypothermia is hereditary. So if someone has malignant hypothermia, the families should be aware because it can actually pass down from parent to children. So genetic testing would be recommended to try identify those who are at risk of malignant hypothermia. Unfortunately, there is no cure for malignant hypothermia, but there are things that we can do as anesthetists to try and avoid a case of malignant hypothermia in those who are high risk of it. And it's also really important to note that malignant hypothermia does not get triggered in every case of anesthetic drugs or gases being given. So it is possible to actually have one or two general anesthetics in the past, like in this case, where she had no side effects to the medication and suddenly have a case of malignant hypothermia. So for those who want to know a wee bit more about the pathophysiology of malignant hypothermia, let's say in normal physiology, let's say if we are, you know, we have to go to the gym and start lifting weights. So our brain tells our muscle to work harder. In that sense, calcium ions will be released into the muscle cells and this allows the muscles to contract. Now, when we put our weights down and start resting, these calcium ions would then be reabsorbed or goes back into storage because our muscles don't need to work anymore. So let's say if we were to go for a run and if we are continuously um, pushing our muscles to the limit. So that's why our heart rate goes up because um, when the heart rate goes up, it pumps and delivers more oxygen into the muscles because as the muscles are working hard, it requires more energy. And to make energy, you know, as we learn in simple biology, we consume oxygen, we breathe in oxygen, we use oxygen to convert into energy, and then we breathe carbon dioxide out. That's why when you're working hard or exercising hard, your breathing rate increases because we need more oxygen, firstly, to create more energy for the muscles to work. And we also need to clear out the carbon dioxide, which is the byproduct of the energy that we've created. So in malignant hypothermia, there is this receptor called Ryano receptor. And this receptor is responsible for the role of releasing the calciums into the muscle cells for it to contract. Now, in patients with uh, the defective genes, the receptor doesn't work properly. So sometimes um, when we deliver anesthesia gas or certain anesthesia drugs, these receptors could uncontrollably be activated, release of excessive calcium ions 
into the uh, the muscle cells causing them to uh, to to start contracting or working you know if you think about it in layman terms it's the same as going to the gym getting strapped onto a treadmill running at an insane amount of speed with no stop button so basically you're being forced to run on this treadmill consistently not being able to stop and not being able to get out and that is why the three cardinal signs of malignant hypothermia is unexpected increase of carbon dioxide, heart rate, and temperature because the body's going like, oh my gosh, this person is working so hard today. We need to increase the heart rate to deliver the oxygen to the muscles to get it working, to get, you know, we need the oxygen to um, create more energy. And that's why patients desaturate. Okay, and as we consume more oxygen in the muscles, it reproduce more carbon dioxide, and that's why patients' carbon dioxide level increases, like in the article. And with the generation of energy and the expenditure of energy, lots of heat is being produced because patients are being put into this into this hypermetabolic state where they keep producing so much energy to get the muscles to work because the muscles are contracting. And that is why uh, malignant hypothermia is such a fatal condition. And that is why we created an antidote to malignant hypothermia, and it's called dantrolene. Now, remember about the Ryano receptors that I was talking about uncontrollably releasing all these calcium ions to get the muscles to contract. So what dantrolene does is it blocks these receptors. So it tries and prevent the excessive calcium ions being released into the muscle cells. Now, malignant hypothermia has been dated back, you know, into the 1960s, where if someone were to experience malignant hypothermia, there's about 70 to 80% chance of the patient actually dying or having a mortality. Now, that's changed with the introduction of dentroline. Now, in the UK currently, Let's say if you get uh, malignant hypothermia, the mortality rate has now decreased from 70 to 80% to about 4% now. But that is still a relatively high risk because can you imagine 1 in 25 people who experience malignant hypothermia would die. But the introduction of dantrolene has been a game changer. Now, the Association of Anesthetists in the UK has developed guidelines in treating malignant hypothermia. They've said there's three things you can do. The first is to eliminate the agent, which the article did say that the anesthetist turned off the anesthetic gas, which could possibly be the potential trigger for this malignant hypothermia. The second thing that they've advised is for active cooling, so things like cold saline into the body or ice packs along the exposed area in the body to try and cool the patient down. And the last thing to uh, treat the patient is with the antidote IV dantrolene, which I could not find in any of these articles that the patient was actually given IV dantrolene in her entire uh, treatment process. However, uh, in the guidelines, of uh, malignant hypothermia, it's also stated that most malignant hypothermia reactions would discontinue after taking the, the trigger um, agent off before even IV dantrolene is actually uh, prepared and injected into the patient. So I think one thing that needs a wee bit of clarification here was that if you had some dantrolene, because, you know, it's not been stated in any of the articles and it's a possibility that they didn't have any dentroline and that's why the patient had to be shipped off to um, the hospital where um, possibly dentroline uh, could be given and also a higher level of care was available. Now, I'm not trying to put a blame on anyone here, okay? The facts are there was an incident and a patient has came to fatal harm. So I think moving forward here, I'm pretty sure there are measures ongoing or already established in place to raise the awareness of malignant hypothermia so that um, the disease or the condition could be spotted earlier on and the appropriate treatment can be administered 
And again, I would like to express my deepest condolences and sympathies to the uh, family affected by this incident. I do hope that they would be able to get access to the uh, relevant testing of the, uh, the genes affiliated to malignant hypothermia so that the, um, the family members would get the appropriate um, anesthesia they need if they would need a surgery in the near future. Now, that's all I have to say about this incident. Um, if you liked the video or it have served a purpose in some sort of educational value to you, please leave a like down below so that it can the video can reach out to more people and further educate the public on conditions like this. If not, um, have a nice day ahead and I'll see you guys next time.